Okay. <laughs> I'm now recording. So welcome again for those of you who are just seeing this for the first time. And um, we're going to get started thanking our donors and sponsors who have made tonight's event free. And be sure to chat in the chat, as I mentioned, if you have any questions or comments, and then we'll leave a little time at the end for discussion. And I think that's about it. Jan, I'm going to let you take it from here because I know you can fill the full 90 minutes. So go. I sure will. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much, Catherine. And, um, you know, I want to tell you to get out your uh, pet. If any of you still do this, I certainly do a pen and a piece of paper because you are gonna need it, maybe more than one piece of paper. I'm gonna mention a lot of films and I'm gonna ask you if you wanna see them. I'm, a lot of them I highlight will be about ones you wanna see. Write it down, okay? Because they're really some ones that maybe you haven't heard of or maybe you need to see again. And that would be great if you uh, write it down rather than uh, get frustrated because you didn't. Okay, okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Jan Wall. I'm a broadcaster, a movie critic. I've been a, a, a columnist. Uh, I've done it all, honey. I've done it all. I have two Emmys. I'm in the Directors Guild, which is very prestigious. I uh, have been around a long time. I've been doing this a long time. And uh, I love film. I grew up loving film. I think I had celluloid running in my veins when I was uh, just coming out of the womb. Uh, I just love it. It started with... Uh, at a very, very young age, uh, I saw a movie called Auntie Mame with Rosalind Russell. See, my parents would sit us down in front of their old Packard Bell TV set. And this was in the late 50s. It was uh, one of the only TV sets in the neighborhood, but we had it. And uh, the neighborhood, by the way, was West LA, uh, swimming pools and movie stars. But we'll get into that in a little while. I was raised with a lot of celebrity and a lot of... Uh, Oh, a lot of excitement because it still was very glamorous in Los Angeles at that time. If anybody's from West LA, I was raised in Beverly Hills and Westwood. So it was very, very exciting back then, but the real thing was the movies. So when I saw Rosalind Russell play Auntie Mame, I realized that she was my mom. I mean, she really reminded me of my mother. My own mother who passed away a couple of years ago, very much was life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. Very much that kind of person. Uh, big traveler, world traveler, exciting, extravagant, rebellious, uh, uh, just a real, real fabulous eccentric. And so that character as played by Rosalind Russell, not the bad remake with Lucille Ball, please forget that one. This is the one, the original one uh, from 56 with, with uh, Rosalind Russell. It's so fabulous. Plus those Ori Kelly costumes and oh, so many things are good about this one. So anyway, I realized I could connect to the movies. I could identify, I could relate. After that, my dad would, uh, he loved anything with Errol Flynn. So I became a huge Flynn fan. And I loved the idea of the excitement and the joie de vivre of Flynn. You know, he was so, you know, follow me, merry men, when he was Robin Hood and uh, when he was Gentleman Jim Corbett or anything he played, he was just so full of life. So I loved that play, you know, that idea of being full of life. And that's what he represented to me at an early age. I didn't want to be made Marion back in the castle going, let's go, Robin, you know, when are you coming home? That's not what I wanted. I wanted to be Robin Hood and all his friends, Friar Tuck and Little John and all of that. So, you know, I loved Errol Flynn. And then my mother was very into us watching, my sisters and I, I had two sisters, us watching anything with intelligent women. So that would mean Catherine Hepburn and Betty Davis. And anytime a, a Catherine Hepburn film, and the first one I fell in love with at an early age, and it sent me right to the bookstore and right to the library. We used to really hang out in libraries back then. I still hang out in libraries. Uh, but anyway, um, Little Women, Louisa May Alcott's Little Women uh, with, with Catherine Hepburn, 1933. I fell in love with that portrayal of Joe March, ambitious, uh, not afraid to be rebellious, you know, just everything I loved and became. So uh, anyway, that was really great. And then of course I would be awed at anything with Betty Davis. I mean, the letter, 
right? Somerset Mom's The Letter, and that sent me right to the library to pick that up. Or uh, now Voyager, where she goes from being uh, so afraid to coming out and being an entire person. It's so marvelous. So those movies really showed me things. Now, my parents were very active in social issues. And anytime a social issue movie would come on, we really gravitated toward that. Uh, because we were Jewish, and we are, you know, I'm still Jewish, of course. Uh, Judgment at Nuremberg was a big one in my family. The Diary of Anne Frank. Gentleman's Agreement, which was this great Gregory Peck film about uh, anti-Semitism being a quiet gentleman's agreement between hateful people. Uh, there's still, these are wonderful films to still see in strong, strong movies. So the Oxbow incident about, uh, about hanging people uh, who are innocent, you know, and uh, mob rule, you know, the danger of mob rule of fury with Spencer Tracy. I mean, there's so many good social issue films. So that was very important to my parents. So I got hooked into that. And then anytime I saw a uh, epic, you know, in those days we would go to the Pantages, so we'd go to the Egyptian theater or the Grauman's Chinese, and we'd see epics like Lawrence of Arabia. When I saw Lawrence of Arabia, I thought this is, you know, the word is so popular now, but back then nobody said it, but I was awed. It was awesome. Uh, and I couldn't believe how great it was. So things like that. These are the ways I connected personally to movies. And so one of the questions I would ask all of you is what's a movie at an early age that you connected personally to? You know, the way I've just described it. Yeah, it does, and it doesn't have to be as old as some of the ones I was describing. It could be anything. It could be right now. In fact, I was just thinking of a movie that I, I related to so much. This one best picture and it won best director and it won best actor and it deserved all of them. I related to this film so much. When I was growing up, I had a speech defect. I couldn't say the letter F. It was very, very cruel to uh, uh, the way other kids treated me because of this. But I learned to have a, a tough shell and also uh, to stick up for myself. That's what my parents taught me to do. So I had a speech defect, sounded like that. So I started going to a therapist and I went to a whole bunch of them. This was in elementary school until I found, and then the beginning of junior high, in, oh, it's called middle school now, until I found one that was just right. Well, lo and behold, a few years ago, what comes out? The movie, The King's Speech. This film spoke to me so much. Uh, I got to interview the director and on the way home from that experience, I had to pull the car over and cry and sob because it touched me. Not that it was about the king. I mean, terrific. It's about the king who stutters. But no, it's about, it's such good filmmaking. It's such empathetic filmmaking that I related to it so deeply and personally that I remembered what it was like to look for a speech therapist and not be able to find one and then to finally find one and change my life. So that was, that's an amazing movie. And it's certainly one to see again. That's the thing with great films. You just see them again and you get something new. You may wanna look at the costumes, at the set design, at the editing, at the direction, at the acting. There's a million things you looked at, at the character players, but see it again, cause it's always worth it. Let's see if we have any questions yet. Oh yes, I see some chats. Let's see what we've got. Okay, okay, love that movie. Okay, I can't tell what movie that is. It says, let's see, let's see if we can get any deeper here. Okay, all I see right now is love that movie. Okay, so that doesn't tell me much. All right, but hopefully I'll find one that does. Oh, here we go. Okay, mine is Dead Poets Society. Okay, I can see why anybody would love this film. Dead Poets Society, you know, I just watched a Betty Davis movie called The Corn is Green. And it's about a teacher in, in Wales and she's trying to teach. And there's also Good Morning Miss Dove with Jennifer Jones and you know, teachers, uh, you know, Mr. Holland's opus, right? With Richard Dreyfus. 
stories about teachers, is, it's so important, so relevant. Teachers change our lives. When I was in high school, there was a teacher who really took, uh, took interest in me, uh, named Mrs. Young. She was known as the, te the toughest teacher at my high school. Nobody liked her, she was so tough. She taught English literature. I loved her. I loved to be challenged by her. And we ended up very close. So Dead Poet Society is about the impact of a teacher, as well as the idea of seize the day. Seize the day. That's the kind of thing I hear in my head all the time. Of course, Robin, our friend, Robin Williams. Oh, I get sad when I think of Robin. I was lucky enough to know him a little bit and certainly see him around the hood here. And uh, he lived around here and, and uh, in Marin where I live. And, and uh, just loved him. He was a really solid guy who the most of all, I've grew up with famous people. I'll get to that in a little bit, but the most accessible famous person I ever met was, was around was Robin. He was so accessible to people, uh, just a lovely man. But anyway, very solid, uh, fine, serious film. My favorite Robin Williams movie is Awakenings. I think he was genius in that. Also, Moscow on the Hudson, genius. He's a wonderful, he was a wonderful actor. His mother always used to say to me, uh, you know, my son, he's not really a comic. He's a seriously trained actor. Yes, yes, you're so right, Mrs. Williams. So uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. If anybody else has one that touches them in any way, you know, it's so funny with movies. They really... They could take us to so many places. And it could be very personal again, or it could be professional. It could be in a love. I wanna tell you something, okay? I've been married to the same man for 40 years. And here's what I know. I know that the movie, The Music Man, Help my marriage. Now, how could that be? It's a musical, it's light and frothy. And Meredith Wilson wrote it about his small town in Iowa, Mason City, and um, which becomes River City in the, in the musical. Robert Preston, so genius is this guy coming into this small town in Iowa, trying to fleece people with this idea of a, a boy's band. Well, my in-laws were from uh, right near Mason City, a small town, just like that in Iowa. And my husband's from there. And I'm from a big city, LA. And our ethnic background is different. Uh, he's Lutheran, I'm Jewish, you know, uh, everything's different. He's used to a world where people don't really talk except about the weather. And uh, it's just a different world. That movie helped me get insight into what my in-laws were like and what was important to them. So, you know, it's funny how things how things work out. Let's see, I can see we've got some more chats, which I love hearing from you guys. So chat away, okay. Uh, I saw the film HUD for the very first time last month. It kind of shocked me. The Paul Newman character was so handsome, yet he was revolting. Yeah, uh, not sure it was touching, but it was bracing and modern in a depressing way. That's okay. Doesn't have to be touching. Bracing is a great word. What do you think about HUD? Okay. HUD is, okay, Newman made these strong films, right? He made a lot of strong films where he was a, um, a drifter, you know, or a hustler, well, the hustler, or, um, you know, any number of movies where he is a guy that you really don't like to like, you know, you don't want to like. And it is depressing the way he acts, you know, whether he's a gigolo or whether he's, uh, a prize fighter, whatever he is, or a drunk lawyer, like in the verdict. So, but he's a very good actor. And HUD is just another, uh, you know, another one of these portrayals of a man who's torn up inside. So what I do is I, I, I enjoy the process. I'll enjoy watching it because I see how low he's going. And, um, you know, the side characters, the wonderful character actors that play in HUD, everybody around him. Uh, so you really get a sense of this guy in the middle who is just so twisted and and fault and he's full of faults. Uh, and where's his heart, you know? So, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I did not not. I mean, I love watching it. Yeah, it's 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 hard and tough and 
you know, like I said, the, the King's Speech was hard and tough, but uh, a lot of movies are hard and tough. I have a, one of the first movies I ever saw is hard and tough to this day, and that's Citizen Kane. This was one of the first movies I ever saw growing up. And I really related to it, yet I found it so sad and still do, but it's so brilliant. Now, what's brilliant about Citizen Kane, you may ask? Well, for me personally, I lived in a muddy neighborhood where money didn't make people happy. And that's certainly the case with Charles Foster Kane and Xanadu. Big house, but really bankrupt spiritually, you know? So that. Also, if, from a cinema point of view, it was the first time you had low ceilings, you had um, cameras going up uh, so that everything looked uh, sort of strange, but still you got the sense of paranoia uh, and, and, and power struggles. It's just such a marvelous film. And uh, the way he uses people, uh, I learned a lot from that film and still do. And uh, it's just one of those movies that was one of the first I ever saw. So another question to you all, it's, you know, what is one of the first you saw that had an effect on you? So uh, yeah, good. So, um, okay. And then uh, I don't think it's any surprise, the next movie I'm going to hold up because this is a film that the backstory, the making of it is just as interesting as the movie itself. And it's part of our lexicon. This is a film that the words, the sayings, the dialogue, the monologues have become part of our lexicon. Here's looking at you, kid. Uh, of, all the, of all the bars in all the world, she had to walk into mine. Um, of all the gin joints in all the world, she had to walk into mine. Um, uh, you know, there's gambling going on here. Here, uh, arrest, arrest everyone. Well, here's your, here's your uh, winnings, sir. You know, I mean, there's so many great moments, and of course, played against Sam. So I'm talking about Casablanca. Now, if you want to read a great book, The Making of Casablanca by Al Jean Harowitz is a terrific book because it talks about the history of Casablanca, the movie. That is the character actors and actresses who were in this, uh, Conrad Veet and everybody. Uh, most of them, most of the character players you see around at the bar at Rick's place and all over, they were actually running from the Nazis. Peter Lorre, uh, their families were uh, being destroyed by the Holocaust and uh, they were running to Hollywood. This was a time that a lot of people uh, were part of the resistance and had to get out of Dodge. And, and it's just so great. You know, I stick my neck out for nobody, all these wonderful things. And I had a chance to interview, you know, along the way I've interviewed just everybody. And Ingrid Bergman told me the hardest thing for her is there's a line in it where she plays Elsa, of course. And they say, you're the most beautiful woman to come into Casablanca. And she said, I wanted them to cut that line so badly. I didn't want to be, you know, everybody could look at me and see I wasn't the most beautiful woman. That would be like Hedy Lamar. And I, I thought, no, no, Ingrid. <laughs> You're being a little modest. Also, Ingrid insisted on not wearing very much makeup. She did through her whole career. She wouldn't let them make her over. She was a good, tough cookie. Uh, anyway, this is a marvelous film, and it stays very romantic. Uh, I probably watch it once a year. I mean, and I've probably seen it a hundred times. So it just shows you that these movies just get better as time goes by. You must remember this, right? Okay. <laughs> So moving right along, uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, okay, for some reason, I'm not, a let me just see what I'm doing here. Okay, here we go. I'm able, okay. I saw, okay, here we go. Okay, uh, um, Casablanca is one of my favorites. What's your favorite Bogart movie and Bergman film? Good, good questions. These are good questions. Um, Boy, it's tough. Those two made so many good ones. I'm going to say Bogart is probably uh, African Queen, the one he won the Oscar for. Um, it's so, you know, he's so gnarly and he's such a, he's so funny in it. I mean, there's comedy in it and his character's so real. And I just love African Queen, you know. 
John Houston, they made it in the Congo. They actually went on location and the director was John Houston and Catherine Hepburn and of course all those other people. And there's a lot of books out on the making of the African queen. And one of the major stories you always hear is that everybody got sick. Everybody got dysentery in the Congo, except for Bogart and John Houston. Why? Because instead of drinking the water, they drank gin and they stayed, they stayed healthy <laughs> and drunk. Anyway, it's a wonderful performance. And I love the film and Hepburn and he are just perfect together. My favorite Bergman film uh, is because I have a certain, I have a certain, uh, it's hard to say Bergman because she's, I mean, so many great ones, of course, Notorious, Hitchcock, da, da, da. But I would go for, um, this is because I have an interest in Romanovs and Russia. I have a side interest in that. So I would definitely go for Anastasia or Anastasia, however you pronounce it. I think that was great. And uh, I'm so glad she came back from the Rossellini scandal and, uh, and was able to make that film. And of course, Yul Brenner's in it, who I love. I find him so vibrant and interesting and exotic. So, uh, but those are very, very good questions. She made so many good films, as did Bogart. You know, I love uh, Petrified Forest early in his career. I mean, ugh, he just kills me. And of course, where he was the, uh, he was the, the detective. I love those Maltese Falcon. I also love Auntie Mame, one of my favorite movies. It's from 58. Good. 1958, Auntie Mame. Please do not miss it. I am a big fan of Doris Day. So am I. So am I. And my favorite of her movies is the pajama game is the game I'm in. And I'm proud to be in the pajama game. I know. Okay, don't get me started. I love Doris Day in the pajama game. But when I got to interview her, we got to talking because the reason I got to interview her is I'm a huge dog fanatic. I just love dogs. Oh, my dog isn't right here right now. But I'm a big dog nut. She is too. She did a lot. She was too. She did a lot to... Uh, to get dogs uh, help and oh, it's just so great what she did for animals, all animals, but anyway, especially dogs. So she told me the movie that was the closest to her and it happens to be my favorite of her films as much as I love the pajama game, I would really put uh, Calamity Jane as the one. She is great in that. And she said that was closest to the real Doris Day. So, uh, but I, I don't think she ever gave a bad performance. I think she was just terrific. And I would recommend her autobiography, which is very sad. Uh, she just kept picking the wrong men and men had ripped her off. And ugh. so finally, I think by the end, she was ready to be alone in Carmel and had a wonderful life and people just loved her and she knew it. So I like to think of that. But Calamity Jane, if you haven't seen it for a long time, this is one great film. So, Doris Day's Best, uh, oh, great musical score. Oh, the pajama game, yes, of course. There once was a man, Ugh, don't get me started. Uh, best performance, very funny, great supporting cast, the original Broadway, that's right, Carol Haney, uh, Eddie Foy Jr. It's very political, yes. Okay, this is the first socialist musical. This is a totally, well, maybe not the first, but definitely a good one. It's a socialist musical. <laughs> Not socialist, it's a union musical. It's like if Norma Ray had, was set to music. This is uh, Doris Day plays the head of uh, uh, the union at a pajama factory. And uh, it's just great because she has to go up against the boss, John Rayet, who I was lucky enough, he signed my hand in junior high because Bonnie Rayet went to my junior high, it's my age, and she went to my junior high for just a while and John Wyatt came to pick her up and I would, had such a crush on him because I had seen him in Annie Get Your Gun with Mary Martin on stage. So I had him sign my hand. I didn't wash my hand for like three days. Um, anyway, he was in the pajama game and now he's only known as Bonnie Raitt's father. Too bad. But anyway, so um, uh, anyway, it's a union leader and she's in love with John Raitt, but he's, yeah, this is what she says. Is the uh, And he's, uh, he's, uh, but she stays true to the union. That's right. It's very good, but it's got a happy ending and all that. So anyway, so that's a lot of fun. Keep your chats coming. I just love reading them. Please tell me something that you love. Tell me some, a star that has made a difference to you. Is there a star that you never stop? Uh, 
I mean, like if you're turning a channel and you suddenly see someone, will you stop? I do that with Gable, with Clark Gable. I will stop anything I'm doing to watch Gable. I think it's because he's so sexy, even later in his life when he made Magambo and, uh, you know, the later movies, uh, Misfits, certainly. And Monroe, I will also stop to look at Marilyn Monroe. Uh, she was better than people say. Uh, she was like an open wound. You could always see her pain. She was so brilliant as sugar cane and some like it. Harvey. I mean, doing comedy is not easy, right? And so she was so great. I want to get back to musicals for a moment. Um, when I saw this musical as a kid, um, okay, my dad played big band drums for fun. He, uh, we had a drum set in the living room and oh man, I mean, Benny Goodman and Louis Armstrong, especially. Uh, that's the kind of music I was raised in and that I still love best, but um, he uh, always had soundtracks for musicals uh, or, or, or original theater recordings usually. And we would always play them and then my sisters and I would act them out. Anyway, one of them was Gypsy. Here's Rosalind Russell again from the film, uh, uh, though Ethel Merman played it in the in the on stage, and it has a wonderful score, you know. Beside for "Let Me Entertain You" and um, you know so many other good songs, uh, but wherever we go, whatever we do, we're gonna go through it together, and so many others. Anyway, so Gypsy is great. Everything's coming up roses. Uh, so uh, that was one of the first ones I saw, and then. I fell in love with travel because of the movies. The movies really took me on trips and I bet that's true to you. Have you ever seen a movie where you, it makes you wanna go somewhere? Well, when I saw Gigi, I said, I gotta go to Paris. I just gotta go to Paris. And of course, this is Paris at the turn of the, the Belle Epoque, right? But I said, I still gotta go to Paris. <laughs> and uh, it's such a wonderful score, of course, Luna and Low and, Thank heavens for little girls and all of those things. And uh, yes, I remember it well. And oh, just everything, Marie Chevalier and uh, director Vincent Minnelli is one of my favorite directors. He did in American in Paris also, another movie that made me want to go to Paris. So, uh, you know, then I went to Paris. <laughs> and there's a wonderful French film of a few years ago called Amalie uh, about a French girl. Uh, who's who's lovesick in Paris. And so I follow Parisian films. Uh, I just uh, just love it. Funny Face. That's a good one. You want to see a great French film? I mean, it's not a French film. It's an American musical by the Arthur Freed unit from MGM. But you do want to see it. It's just so great. Just check in to see if anybody's chatting at me. Okay. Aha, here we go. Okay, Montgomery Clift. She'll always stop and look at Montgomery Clift. I think that's great. Uh, Clift, you know, I do a lot with alcohol and drugs in the, uh, with movie stars and in the movies. And uh, I find that a very interesting subject. And poor Montgomery Cliff. I mean, in Raintree County, he, while he was making that movie with Elizabeth Taylor and Eva Marie Saint, he got a car accident, right? And it's a pretty famous story. So before that, like in Red River and these other movies, he was extremely good looking. And then he got in this car accident, his face completely changed. And I think uh, it led to alcoholism uh, and drug use, but uh, he still was a very important and good actor. And uh, he, he came from within and told us his truth. And I could see why you would stop every time he was on. Uh, then uh, she, he also said, uh, here's something Meryl Streep, uh, definitely Meryl Streep. So uh, I got to spend the day with Meryl Streep. Yay. Um, she and Renee Zellweger came through town. This was a long time ago, but you know, like maybe 12 years ago or something, not that long ago, but uh, that she had made a movie, Meryl Streep, about her mother dying of cancer. She played her own mother and Renee Zellweger played her daughter. And oh, it was good. William Hurt was in it. So we were showing it to women because uh, it was a way to raise money for various women's organizations. So we went to some theaters and I got to hang out. And I'm telling you, uh, Renee was so sweet and so um, shy. She was not really the big star she is now, but I have a feeling she's still pretty shy. And um, she, uh, she was in awe of Meryl as everybody was. So anyway, Meryl Streep told me the sexiest moment she ever had on film 
was in Out of Africa when um, Robert Redford washes her hair. I think that's pretty cool. That's a great scene. But also it reminds you that, you know, you don't have to show sex on screen for something to be sexy. Think of your favorite sexy moments on film. They're not people rolling around in the hay. They're not people laying in bed thrashing around. You know what they are? Desire. They're showing you desire. And uh, that's what uh, I love best. I think of the movie Picnic and one of the sexiest moments that must have been moon glow. Da -da 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 -da. And Kim Novak's walking down the stairs, you know, clapping. And there's William Holden at the bottom of the stairs and he's looking up and she's looking down. They start swing dancing slowly. And you don't really need the thrash around it, but it's so hot, it's so sexy. And later on, when they are by the side of the railroad tracks and Josh Logan, they're kissing and Josh Logan's camera goes up to tumultuous sky, that's enough. Everything else happens in your imagination and that's what makes it so wonderful. So that's the sexiest moments of all. And uh, that's what I love. And then you also said Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman reminds us that a great voice does it all, you know, a great voice in movies. We used to have amazing voices in the movies. James Mason, Charles Lawton, Lauren Bacall. Think of these, deep, Tallulah Bankhead. Think of these deep, low, rich voices. We don't have that anymore. So when Morgan Freeman comes along, no wonder he plays God all the time. I mean, he's got that rich, deep voice and he's so wonderful. Now, everybody, seems to love Shawshank Redemption. That seems to be most people's favorite movie when it comes to Morgan Freeman. But everything he does, like you said, you stop and look at everything. Uh, he's great. I love him in The Unforgiven. But Shawshank was such a special film. And the thing Shawshank had going for it is that it has a happy ending. And so many movies don't. I mean, this is a prison movie with a happy ending, a really brutal prison movie. Yet they end up in Zihuatanejo in Mexico. <laughs> it's really good. Sorry if I blew the ending for anybody. I don't usually do that, but it's a wonderful film. And if you haven't seen it, if you see it or you see it again, you'll remember why it's everybody's favorite, favorite film. I mean, not everybody's, but I get asked a lot about it. So that's good. Okay. Moving right along. Don't you love it when you discover a new movie and it's great? Amazingly, right now, there's a good movie out. That's pretty amazing because I, I think Hollywood is going downhill. Now, there will be some good movies. They come out around October, November, December in time for Oscar voters and all of that to be reminded or be told of them. And uh, it's really terrific. But there's a good movie out right now about Aretha Franklin called Respect with Jennifer Hudson. Highly recommended, very good. However, it's a half hour too long. So one of the problems in my friend, the late Ross Hunter used to tell me, he was a producer, that um, there's nobody telling the studios cut that movie. You know, the inmates run the asylum, the production companies run and decide how much and all that, how long. So there's nobody saying, you know, let's cut this movie a little bit. So it's two and a half hours. And I think it's about a half hour too long. However, it is so good. It is such quality. It is so worth seeing. So I hope you all will see respect uh, about Aretha Franklin. So when you discover a little movie, now that's not a little movie. I mean, that's getting a lot of attention. But I found this little movie and I love it. I watch it once a year, okay? And it's not even my faith or anything. It has nothing to do with that. It's it's like, you know how Field of Dreams is just spirituality. If you build it, they will come. I mean, it doesn't matter what faith you are. The Ten Commandments, you know, wonderful C.B. DeMille spectacular. It doesn't matter what faith you are. Well, there's all kinds of movies like that. The Robe, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you just f f kind of fall in love with the, the whole uh spirituality of it, that somebody is trying to follow their own sense of God as they see God, you know? So it's really great stuff. And, and plus it has to be very well made. Well, so this little movie comes by. To this day, nobody knows this movie. Okay, it's called The Way, okay, The Way. 
okay? And all it, it is, is it is about Spain's El Camino de Santiago pilgrimage, okay? And Martin Sheen uh, goes on this pilgrimage on that El Camino de Santiago, and he goes on it uh, to try to come to terms with his son's death. It is just so remarkable. It was directed by his son, uh, who should, Emilio Estevez, who should have got some kind of nomination for it. It's just brilliant. And uh, who also did the screenplay. So Martin, Short, uh, Martin Sheen got nothing for this, but it is such a good movie. If you ever get a chance, it's called The Way. And it's uh, ugh, so brilliant. So I love it when you discover a little movie that nobody knows, you know, that's just so special. So uh, great. Okay, have you discovered a movie that nobody knows? Oh, there's so many times that happens. So then I love movies with happy endings. This is so crazy, but I love it when a movie has a happy ending. I don't wanna be depressed. I like it when a movie is, uh, I mean, yeah, I get depressed a lot and a lot of movies don't have happy endings. So I was talking about Holocaust movies or uh, movies that make you think a lot and, and just, you know, uh, there's a lot of films that don't have happy endings, like La La Land. You, I liked it very much, but then you think, well, did they get together? They didn't. Uh, what drives people apart? Um, there's a million movies that don't really have happy endings, you know, but you have to, uh, but I like in life once in a while, <laughs> I like to find the uh, attitude of gratitude of a happy ending. So this is the movie that I see about once a year. And this is called Notting Hill. And Notting Hill is so fun. It's about the world's most famous movie star. You know, she's on the cover of every magazine. Every time she makes a move, the whole world knows about it, okay? And she's played by uh, Julia Roberts. Well, this little kind of schmucky guy owns a bookstore in this quaint neighborhood of uh, Notting Hill. He's got this stagnant business. He's got the roommate from hell and his love life is like non-existent, okay? And one day, these two people, their paths cross. Now, can two people fall in love with the whole world watching? And can two very opposite people from very opposite worlds fall in love? And can something good happen come out of this? It's got such comedy, so well directed, so well, uh, the wonderful character actors. You've got Hugh Bonneville, you know, from Downton Abbey, a lot of people know him, Emma Chambers, um, Ray Fifens. Oh, wonderful character actors. But this is really led by Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts. And Julia Roberts told me that she did not want to play this role at all. She fought against it because she didn't want to play just a movie star role. She just thought, oh, it's just a movie star role. It's a throwaway. She likes to play more character parts. Well, I got to tell you, she was so perfect for this. I'm so glad she played it because it's just a beautiful film. So that's an example of one with a very happy ending, very satisfying, like Valentine's Day movie. Mm. I do this speech called Hollywood Does the Holidays. And I talk about, you know, great kind of movies for the holidays where you need something good to, to feel good about. You don't need, you know, uh, teenage thrillers or some junk like that. Growing up, I loved Cat People, the original. Yes. Now, see, there you go. Cat People, before I read the rest, Cat People. Remember I was saying how sex, you don't have to show everything to feel it. Well, the same goes for violence. And with the Cat People, um, there's a scene where she's just walking down the street, and you, a dark street, and you do not have to see anything but you just hear the rustle in the trees and that's enough to scare the heck out of you. And she's up by a pool and, and you see a quick shadow. You don't have to see anything to be scared. Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock used to say, it's not about the gun or the knife, it's the anticipation of the gun or the knife. So it's that idea of your head using the imagination and he sets the mood a good filmmaker sets the mood, you know, using editing and music and lighting and all kinds of things, storytelling, um, acting, and you don't need to see blood and guts. And that's what makes it so effective. So let's see what else you said. Okay, Cat People, the original, and the 80s remake was pretty good too. Okay, never saw that. 
Can you name some good classic horror movies? Any modern ones which you like? I love The Witch and Midsummer. Okay, here's a big confession. I'm afraid I'm your wimpy movie critic. Don't like scary movies. Um, I have trouble with scary movies. I just can't get them out of my head and they really hurt my sleeping patterns. <laughs> so I'm not great with, with that genre. I'm very good with musicals and comedies. I haven't even gotten into comedies yet and I'm excellent with other genres. Um, uh, you know, I'm really good with dramas and melodramas and all kinds of historical, historical films, biopics, you know, biographies but I'm not good with uh, scary films. I'm sorry. I mean, I've seen, of course, the classics, Dracula, Frankenstein, uh, Psycho, only, but I only see originals, you know? I don't see remakes or reshoots because, or reboots because um, they have a tendency to be bloodier than this. And I just don't want to do it to myself. And also I like to keep the original in my, clear in my head and not have it replaced. But um, I'm not good at that genre. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to be disappointing. When something's scary and really well done, right? Like the Robert Mitchum movie directed by Charles Lawton where he's a, a priest after the children's money. I mean, really scary, right? He has love on one hand and hate on the other. And it's, oh, it's really scary stuff. Then, you know, tension, I'm good with mysteries uh i'm good with but not horror films so i'm sorry I, I i just just can't do it fortunately i've gotten to the place in my career where i don't have to see, have to do it so uh that's a good thing so uh anyway moving right along i wanted to tell you about another movie that had me heading straight to italy this movie when i saw it i went i, I gotta go to italy and got led me straight to the book straight to the book. And uh, I just fell in love with it. Of course, I'm in love with this actress. Oh, that's another thing. If I ever see this actress, I never turn the channel. And that is Diane Lane. And this is called Under the Tuscan Sun. And it's based on the book, bestseller. And it's about a woman who goes to Tuscany and uh, gets a house and starts living there. Uh, it's just so great. She's a uh, uh, she was Academy Award nominated for this. She's a San Francisco writer, right? And she um, uh, gets 10 days in Tum Tuscany, falls in love, and her, her entire life is changed. It's such a great film, Under the Tuscan Sun. Similarly, we talk about Julia Roberts, Eat, Pray, Love, another one. I uh, haven't been to India yet, one of the few places I haven't been yet, but uh, Eat, Pray, Love is very good because uh, Eat, you know, at Italy, Pray, she goes to India, and then Love, she, I think she ends in Bali, and I've been to Bali, and so that was really, really terrific and got me really interested in more travel, and I'm just a travel girl, you know, uh, and so uh, those movies really inspire me. Uh, there is a fabulous film. Please write it down. It is so fabulous. It's called Shirley Valentine, and it takes place on Mykonos, the island of Mykonos. But really, it originally takes place in like Liverpool, and she's a board housewife, British housewife, and she takes a little trip to, uh, to Greece with a girlfriend and ends up falling in love with the island and with herself. Right? It's not just about, oh, I fall in love with some guy. No, no, no. It's deeper than that. It's more important than that. There we go. Thank you. Not, okay. Wait. Okay. Thank you. By the way, Night of the Hunter is the Robert Mitchum film that I was relating to. And, uh, and uh, the Charles Lawton, the only time, I mean, it was so crazy. He was such a great director. And yet the film was a flop, which is crazy because it, it's, if you want to get scared, I always talk about it in my Hollywood Does the Holidays because Halloween is the time to see Night of the Hunter. It is a scary movie. Lillian Gish, Shelley Winters, oh, it's so fabulous. Um, okay, and then here's, uh, here's some more cool stuff that you guys are sending me, which I appreciate. Please keep going. A favorite director is Billy Wilder. Yes, sexy and continental from Vienna especially The Apartment. Great drama, great comedy, and a scathing look at the business world. 
a great ending. Yeah. Jack Lemon, Shirley MacLaine. She says, shut up and deal. I love you. Shut up and deal. Um, the thing is that there's so many ways to look at Billy Wilder. Oh, such a fan, such a, just a, just a complete fan, fanatic of Billy Wilder. What he did is he brought a lot of sophistication, like Ernst Lubitsch, he brought a lot of uh, European sophistication into Hollywood, and he would create these films that would, you know, he started out as a writer, you know, there's lots of ways directors come into it, right? George Stevens was a cameraman, and John Huston was a journalist, and a lot of people come into it in different ways. Um, you know, Robert Weiss was an editor, right? He edited Citizen Kane. So, I mean, people come into it in different ways. Well, Billy Wilder uh, comes into it as a writer. He's a screenwriter. And um, I mean, he was also a journalist in, in, in uh, Vienna, but he really knew how to be sophisticated about sexuality and sex, you know? And he does that in the apartment. Uh, in the apartment, it's about, it's such a modern story. It should be re-released. I don't know they could remake it because I don't think today's actors and actresses have the gravitas to make that film, but certainly we're seeing again. I showed it to my niece once because she was being hit on by her boss. And I wanted her to see where that took Shirley MacLaine having an affair with her boss. It's so weird to think of Frederick Murray in that role as the lecherous, immoral boss, um, because um, cruel boss, because um, he, you know, we think of him as my three sons and the sweet guy, you know, but Wilder talked him into it, just like he did in Wilder's own personal favorite, Double Indemnity. He thought, well, I think I see something in this guy that he could play evil. And boy, does he. So anyway, uh, I love the apartment and Lemon is just perfect in it. And uh, it's, it's about being harassed at work, sexually harassed. That's before the Me Too movement. So it's a very hip, special film. And I'm glad you brought up Billy Wilder. So I'm interviewing Billy Wilder at the Director's Guild and he says, I've only made one perfect film and everybody in the audience is like, what, Sunset Boulevard, uh, Some Like It Hot, uh, you know, uh, uh, Stalag 17. It could be any number of things, Lost Weekend. He says, no, no. It was only um, uh, the one with Barbara Stanwyck and, and uh, uh, please, I know you're yelling at the, at the set, just a minute, Double Indemnity. He said it was only Double Indemnity. He said that was my perfect film because it had the casting I wanted. You know, he wanted um, different people for different roles in different films. Uh, for example, he wanted Montgomery Cliff to play the William Holden role in Sunset Boulevard. And so, and he wanted Mae West for uh, Gloria, uh, for Norma Desmond or, or any number of other women before he got to Gloria Swanson who made it her own and should have won the Oscar. I still resent the Academy for that, but okay, I'll let go. I'll try anyway, but I haven't done it yet. Anyway, so uh, I absolutely adore Billy Wilder, love his work. Some Like It Hot is my favorite comedy of all time, and I'm not the only one who feels that way. Also, um, uh, um, some other films of Billy Wilder. Anytime you can give yourself a Billy Wilder Film Festival, just do it. Just do it. Uh, Catherine, did you have anybody who wanted to interrupt or couldn't get on the chat or anything like that? Or shall I keep going, honey? Um, so far, I, you're hitting all of the chats that are coming in. So keep okay, going. good, good. Sometimes people can't do the chat and so they want to verbalize something. And that would be fine too. Okay, moving right along. Yeah, um, um, actually, Dan, yeah. uh, let's, yes. let's take a moment. If anybody hasn't been able to chat and you want to come off mute and ask a question. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So I really love uh, anything to do with show business. I read probably a show business book every two weeks, sometimes once a week, depending how good it is. So I want to tell you about some amazing show business books. Um, I just read a new one. A new one. I usually only read classic show business books. Like this one just came out. I knew this woman, so I had to read this book. This just came out. Look at this cover. Can you see? It's called Mean 
Moody Magnificent, Jane Russell and the Marketing of a Hollywood Legend. New book just came out, okay, by Rice. A woman named uh, Rice, R-I-C-E. Mean, Moody and Magnificent, Jane Russell and the Marketing of a Hollywood Legend. Ugh, I can't even put it down, it's so good. And this woman was so interesting, Jane Russell, because she was like a female Robert Mitchum. But because she was female and so beautiful and sexy and her image was so sexualized by Howard Hughes and then everybody else, you think she would be that way. Well, she wasn't. She's just a cowgirl. She's just like, and later in her life, she became like an old hippie. She's very spiritual, very, you know, spiritual. But she was also so simple and kind and down to earth. No wonder she helped Marilyn Monroe so much in one of my favorite musicals ever made, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And this is just a wonderful book. And I, I, I just came out, so I'm so glad. I think because some of the people have died in it, uh, who, are, who are mentioned in it, uh, the author was able to really tell the truth. Now, here's a new one that I just read. This is just so interesting. I did not expect to like this, but I was at an airport and I needed a book to read on the plane suddenly. And uh, I couldn't get my, to my luggage with my books. And so I picked this up at the airport and it's called Green Lights. And it's by Matthew McConaughey, who's a really fine actor. And soon to be politician, I think. I don't know his politics, but that's okay. I don't wanna know. But anyway, uh, boy, is this interesting. I mean, I don't, I didn't really read the poetry that's kind of sprinkled in and some of the weird stuff, but, because of course he has weird stuff because he's a weird guy, but it is so interesting. I don't know how this guy made it through his life in Texas. I really don't. And then his idea of fun is to go to Peru or Mozambique and, and you know, and, and, and sleep on the ground with snakes. I mean, he is such a weird guy. And uh, he's, but he's also a happy family man. And he takes his kids and his wife with him and she's must be a hell of a good sport. But anyway, this is called Green Lights. I enjoyed it because it, it's a hard life this guy had. I don't know how he made it through. And then of course, of course, there's no way if I find a book that's out of print and I can pick it up, I will grab it. And this is one called Steps in Time, forwarded with by, the forward is by Ginger Rogers, but the book is by Fred Astaire. This is his autobiography and it's paperback. And I just saw it in just this, one of these stores I go in to look for old books and it is so terrific. And it's really about the making of all these wonderful films uh, that, that Astaire made. And uh, it's just great if you can find it. I often go into like resale shops or shops where they have people come and dump their stuff and find things there. I think this one, the library had it on sale in their a second, second shop or whatever, but I'm really enjoying that. So it just tells you these wonderful books that I find. God, I just feel so lucky. It could just be about anything uh, that has to do with show business but it has to do with show business. I don't wanna read anything else. Oh, except I do read things on the Romanov dynasty. I mean, I'll read some other stuff, but not very often. It's, it's showbiz for me always. Here's another one I really love a lot. This is, uh, this is really good. I found this on uh, Google, not Google. Uh, oh yes, Google. I was looking up Peter O'Toole. Peter, okay, first favorite comedy is Some Like It Hot. Second favorite comedy is called, write it down, My Favorite Year, okay? It's called My Favorite Year. And it's what happens when Errol Flynn, true story, got booked on the Sid Caesar Comedy Hour, right? In the 50s. And he had to pay back the IRS. He, uh, Flynn owed the IRS all kinds of money. So he had to pay back the, you know, here's my wicked, wicked ways. I mean, Flynn was a wicked, wicked boy. He wrote a book called My Wicked, Wicked Ways. Anyway, so he gets booked on the Sid Caesar Comedy Hour. This poor comedy writer, based on Mel Brooks's actual experience with Flynn, had to keep him sober so he could be on the show. And uh, it's all about that. So this is called My Favorite Year. 
So I'm looking up Peter O'Toole because I couldn't, be I wanted to find out who he was up against that he didn't win the Oscar for this thing. He's so brilliant. He'd already been nominated six times, seventh time nominated, never won. I thought who in the hell was against him that he didn't win this? Well, how do you go up against Gandhi? Ben Kingsley won that year. What are you going to do? Anyway, so I'm looking it up and I found this book uh, that they had on, um, on, uh, I could order it, right? And so it's called Hellraisers. And boy, are they ever. Hellraisers. And this is uh, P Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole, and Olive, Oliver Reed. These guys, right? And they were drunks and Hellraisers and uh, profoundly flawed yet awesome leading men. Uh, it's a window into a time when glamour was sacrosanct and when stardom was achieved rather than manufactured. So these guys all had terrific leading roles. There's all kinds of colorful anecdotes. Uh, it's just wonderful. It's called Hellraisers by Robert Sellers. It really ca captures the decadence and uh, uh, the way these guys were kind of, uh, uh, kind of outrageous, but also rowdy and also incredibly talented and what happened to all of them. Some of them lived longer than they really deserved to, I'll tell you that. So Hellraisers, The Life and Inebriated Times of Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole and Oliver Reed. Can't believe Peter O'Toole lived to be 81. I mean, he drank enough. And I did an interview with uh, at the uh, Wine Country Film Festival with Richard Harris. I got to spend a bunch of time with him and he lived to be pretty old too, considering what he consumed. Uh, but uh, the other two did not. It, it's just really interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, book. I could barely put this one down. And so these are the kind of things that I just, I just go crazy for. I just really go nuts. Sometimes I'm interviewing, oh, I really didn't get to tell you very much about LA. Okay, I'll tell you a little about growing up in West LA. Swimming pools and movie stars, like they sang in uh, the Beverly Hillbillies theme song, the TV show. Uh, growing up in West LA was so exciting. I mean, I'd see Natalie Wood at the gynecologist, Barbara Stanwyck at the market. Um, Gable, when I was a little girl, would go to a specialized men's shop that my father went to to get his suits made. Um, these people were everywhere. Uh, I mean, it was great. And they were so nice. You know, Kirk Douglas, uh, Don Rickles at synagogue. I mean, people were so nice because they had all worked their way up. Uh, that's why it's really great to read uh, uh, Kirk Douglas's book, Ragman's Son, because it's all, you know, it, the stars today that I interview, and I interview a lot of them. I do. Still, I'm working a lot still, more than I ever thought I would. <laughs> and I still interview the stars today, but they're so boring today. Most stars today don't know anything and they're stupid and they're, they haven't educated themselves on their own field. I mean, it's like, frankly, to not know Betty Davis and be an actor is like being an architect and not know Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, these people are dumber than dirt, really. And so uh, some of them aren't, but most of them are. So anyway, very self-indulgent and caught up in their own ego. So anyway, and listening to their own press reports. So the good news is that when I was growing up, the stars had a lot of class, man. They were so grateful, uh, just so grateful for everything that was given to them through their own hard work, of course, and their own talent. But, uh, you know, it was a nice, nice way to be raised. Today, a star would, you know, ugh, I was just at a hotel where this kid Justin Bieber was and everybody was acting like it was the second, you know, coming basically. And, and, and to me, so what? And he wasn't even nice to people. He didn't even look at anybody. Uh, I mean, you know, it just, yeah. But growing up in West LA was exciting. I mean, it was exciting times. It was the fifties and sixties, you know? And I remember uh, very clearly being in a car when I was a Girl Scout uh, station wagon. Remember those old station wagons? It was about eight of us in there, you know, Girl Scout uniforms. And we stopped at a stoplight and Sinatra was right across the way uh, next to us in his car and his convertible. And we all started screaming like he was a Beatle, like he was one of the Beatles, you know, who were popular at the time. And he just cracked up laughing and waved at us. And it was just so great. 
I mean, they were all like that. And uh, now it's not the same. However, there's still some great actors out there. Don't, you know, don't let me uh, steer you wrong. There's some wonderful people and they're doing the best they can. A lot of them, a lot of them are really good. Uh, ben Affleck gave me one of the greatest interviews of my life. Ben Affleck is so smart and personable. And I went down and interviewed him for Pearl Harbor down in Hawaii. And, oh, he was just so smart and uh, willing to talk and, and, and historically, uh, you know, uh, aware. And uh, I just loved being with him. And Matt Damon is the same way, his friend. He's also the same way. And so there's all these people that, you know, Jodie Foster. I remember walking out of an interview with her and thinking, she is way too smart for Hollywood. She ought to be teaching at Yale. And I think she did. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, so there's all these people that are really bright and wonderful. Uh, it's just, uh, it's few and far between. It's not like, you know, it's not like it was. It's not like Hedy Lamar inventing uh, everything that we use now for our cell phones. Uh, so, uh, by the way, if you want to read a great book about Hedy Lamar, you have to uh, read a book called The Only Woman in the Room. And it's all about the life of Hedy Lamar, the only woman in the room. And it is remarkable. You know, because she was so beautiful, no one paid attention to what she was doing or saying or took her seriously. And here she was an inventor, a science genius. Oh, so interesting. And she ran away from her Nazi. Uh, he, he used to do munitions for the Nazis. And she ran away from him and uh, came to Hollywood. It's just a wonderful, wonderful story. So, uh, boy, I hope you guys see that. Um, okay, I got some new messages here. Let me just see what I've got. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. Forgive you for not liking scary movies. Jeff. Thank you. How about comedies? For example, is there anything as funny as March doesn't? No. You want to see little kids laugh. You want to see, I've taught kids, you know, I've taught kids and, uh, it's great to show them Groucho. They love the way he moves and they love Harpo and they love Ch Chico, the way he does the piano with the fingers. They love the Marx Brothers and I love the Marx Brothers, you know, with their, uh, especially that group of like four films that were very tight. So um, I really, really love the Marx Brothers and I love Groucho. He was so funny. And later on, I watched him in You Bet Your Life, you know, and he was just, uh, just genius. And so comedies, I'm very big with comedies. I love a film called You Can't Take It With You. It's a Frank Capra film, and it's very funny and very good with Jimmy Stewart and uh, Gene Arthur and a huge amount of character players. And it's just wonderful about an eccentric family and this uh, and the woman in the family, the young young woman. Um, Jimmy Stewart is rich and he falls in love with this kind of, you know, middle in. Well, she has no income, but anyway, this woman. I mean, she has an income, but her family is just kind of middle class. Uh, and it's run by Lionel Barrymore, who this is his best role. He plays a guy who believes that um, money doesn't buy everything. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful film, wonderful character players. If you ever want to see some very good character players. And that's uh, a great film. And then I love Harvey. I mean, What's a movie that made you fall in love with somebody? Well, for me, my husband reminds me of Jimmy Stewart because he doesn't talk much, but when he, you know, and it's hard for him to get it out, you know, uh, 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 you know, and, but when he does, I listen, but he doesn't talk much. And he's just this quiet, kind man. And that's very similar to Elwood P. Dowd, played by Jimmy Stewart in the movie Harvey. And Harvey sees a, uh, and, and Harvey is a giant white rabbit that's only seen by Elwood. Uh, it's such a marvelous film. And so these funny, but then I'm thinking of something like Some Like It Hot or these wackier films. And then recently, Arthur with uh, Dudley Moore, uh, one of my favorite funny movies, really great. And then also um, only the original though, you don't see part two of stuff. And then also um, When Harry Met Sally, now there's a movie that's so relevant, it's crazy, but it's a great comedy. It's can men and women be friends without having to sleep together? 
and it asks this really profound question. And it's just so well done. And, and Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan, terrific together. You know, you got to have a strong woman and a strong man. The battle of the sexes only works when both sides are armed. And so you have to be both strong. And that's what works so well in this. And, uh, you know, the I'll have what she's having. You know, I was saying how Casablanca is not part of the lexicon is the language from Casablanca. Well, that's true with when Harry met Sally. Everybody says, I'll have what she's having. I mean, that's just a typical thing now. So um, I just love comedy. I love well, well written comedies. They're hard to find now because the uh, writers are so young. They don't have a background in good writing. And also there's a, some really bad things have happened to Hollywood movies. One is that they appeal to the young too much. They're trying to get every age they can. So they don't want to use like they won't mention something like the New Deal because, well, young people don't know about that. So, there, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, problems in, in this thing about because Jaws made so much money and Star Wars made. So that's the beginning of this rolling ball, this roll toward always appealing to the young because they buy the merchandise, they're critic proof, and they go the first weekend that the movie comes out. So there's real reasons for this. And so that's one of the reasons you're seeing that. And so that's a real problem. The other problem is that packaging of stars is a problem because uh, you can't like mad, 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 mad world, right? You're not going to get that today. You're not going to ever get that kind of a group of big comics, you know, or big stars together very rarely. Uh, it's just, there's a packaging issue that happens now. So uh, there are real reasons why you get what you get uh, in Hollywood right now, why you're getting the movies. And how many times have you gone to a movie and said, um, you know, I just wasted my time and I just wasted my money. So the one thing when I review movies, I ask myself is, is it worth your time and money? That's what I was saying about respect, the really good new biopic on Aretha Franklin. Yeah, it's worth your time and money. I don't say that very often. I really don't, I really don't. There's a lot of good things on Netflix, by the way. And there's a lot of good things, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things on Hulu and, you know, there's a lot, you know, but I want to go to the big screen. I want my cinema paradiso, you know? I want to share with people and laugh and cry and have that feeling of other people enjoying it. I mean, I want that feeling and you don't get that at home. You really don't. Okay, here's some more messages here. Fred and Ginger, yes. Fred and Ginger always bring joy. What are your favorite dance films? I'm just about to teach a class in that. Well, actually, I'll be teaching class in that um, uh, for From Institute, F R O W M Institute. It's part of UCSF. They do Zoom. And on January, I'll be teaching class in dancing and documentaries, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, what are your favorite dance films? I'd say Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Singing in the Rain, The Bandwagon. This, I mean, they each have great dancing moments. But here's one I really love. All that jazz, all that jazz. Let's see. There we go. This is Bob Fosse. I love Bob Fosse. And if they don't screw up, his, okay, I'll tell you another great dancing movie, Chicago. But this is great, all that jazz. This is the story about Bob Fosse. It's highly sexualized, but he had a sexy life. So, but I love his style, you know, his style of dancing. And the movie Chicago, luckily, was made by a choreographer who turned into a director, Rob Marshall. And I think Chicago has wonderful dancing. Also, Hairspray, where they kind of captured the 60s. And uh, those are some recent ones. But then I'll go back to... Uh, to the classic movie musicals that were done by the Arthur Freed unit. So that's the MGM unit that did all the great musicals. So I uh, did a lot of great musicals. So, you know, everything from the King and I to South Pacific to, you know, different numbers uh, are just so fun. And uh, Damn Yankees. And I mean, I could go on and on about <clears throat> dance movies and choreographers, you know, and of course, Fred and Ginger, Swing Time, and top hat. I mean, everything they did, she did it backwards and high heels, but you know, that together they just made love while dancing. I mean, it was just fantastic to watch them. I also love a movie, uh, Call Me Madam, that has some great music and dancing, Donald O'Connor and Vera Ellen. 
And also, um, there's a really good number with Danny Kay and Vera Ellen called uh, uh, The Best Things Happen While You're Dancing. And that's from um, White Christmas. So there's just a million great numbers that I, uh, I adore. And you mentioned Jane Russell. I haven't seen much beyond Gentlemen Prefer Blonde. Oh, okay, good. What you've got to do is see a movie with Robert Mitchum and Vincent Price called The Las Vegas Story. Fantastic. Also Macau, also Robert Mitchum. She made a lot of movies with Robert Mitchum. They were very close friends and stayed great friends until he died. And Macau uh, is a wonderful, and that has Gloria Graham in it too. So man, you get sultry Gloria and you get sultry Jane Russell. It's like this, two-fisted punch. It's fantastic film, but she's good in everything, really. I mean, even, even in a movie that's kind of crummy, like The Outlaw, the movie that made her a star, she just, I don't know, she seems very natural and very good. But they, the thing that this book gets into uh, about Jane Russell, you know, about, uh, is that they marketed her, is that they, they really, they sexualized her so tremendously. And you know, she was just a tough broad, you know, she was a great tough broad and I loved her. Uh, she, let me tell you something she did that was great at the end. Um, so the last, I got to know her at the end of her life, okay? And we were at a event, we were raising money because she's always raising money for uh, charities in Europe, uh, for orphans and all kinds of things she was involved with. Uh, she's just great. And so she comes in this outfit. And she did this a couple of times I saw her, including at a tribute that I did with her. She comes in this sort of uh, like caftan, okay? She's still got that gorgeous Jane Russell thing, but she's got like this salt and pepper hair and it's kind of kind of out there, you know? And uh, she had Birkenstocks on and she came up on the, st she'd get up on the stage and, she'd, and she did this a couple of times. She got it on stage and she said, uh, well, you are looking at me, she says, and you're thinking, Jane Russell, she doesn't look so good. She said, and you know what? You guys don't look so good either. <laughs> I always thought that was great. She was just a great gal. So anyway, uh, anything, including the Las Vegas story and Macau, you would love with Jane Russell. Uh, so what do you think will happen? What do you think will happen uh, to the future of cinema? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's such a hard question because it's so sad. You know, I try to, as I mentioned, an attitude of gratitude. I try to have a, you know, what was that great? Uh, you've got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. I would like to live like that. Johnny Mercer, great songwriter. But uh, I don't feel good about the future of cinema. I don't. And that's why I'm so happy I study the past so much because those movies only get better every time you see them. You just look for other things. And Tuna Classic Movies, TCM, I mean, they'll show you all kinds of good things and film noir that Eddie Muller does and all kinds of wonderful uh, ways of celebrating the greats, you know? But uh, there'll always be room for good movies, you know, the Academy, the Motion Picture Academy. I was just down in LA, they have a new museum that's opening, that's amazing. It's opening in October, October 1st, I think, the Motion Picture Museum from the Academy, people who give out the Oscars, incredible place. And uh, that's gonna lead people to classic films, but that has a lot of new stuff, you know, it has Wakanda and a lot, and Spike Lee, who's great and all kinds of new stuff, but it also has the classics. So uh, the future, I think because of the Academy Awards, See, the Academy Awards, we need them. They give out quality. You know, they don't give out box office. They don't give out awards for best box office. That would be some other crummy thing. This is a crummy award show. You know, this is for quality. So as long as people are shooting for quality, not for box office, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. At least I hope so. <laughs> but like I said, we always have the good ones. So that's uh, something to be grateful for. Uh, okay, and uh, let's see, anything else? Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. These are some great questions, you guys. 
did you see the ministry of Bob Fosse yet? Did I see the miniseries? I certainly did. I couldn't wait to see it because I'm a huge Gwen Verdon fan as well as a Bob Fosse fan. She should have had a bigger movie career too. Um, great dancer. Whew. She should have done the movie Sweet Charity, not uh, Shirley MacLaine. As good as MacLaine is, it should have been Gwen Verdon. She was too old at the time, so they gave it to McLean. McLean was good, but she had a bad, uh, there was a, a bad casting problem in that film. And then also uh, with the people, with the man that was opposite her, but also uh, they put in, anyway. So uh, Fosse and Verdon, Verdon and Fosse, Verdon, Fosse, Fosse and Verdon. I think it was called Fosse and Verdon. Uh, it was very disappointing to me. I'll tell you why. I'm a critical thinker. And I like to be very specific. I've taught critical thinking and I like to be very specific. They call me Miss Specific because what exactly didn't work? Well, what didn't work was uh, she was very good, the woman playing uh, uh, Fosse, uh, Gwen Verdon. But the problem was Sam Wackwell playing, um, playing uh, he played it where you never got to see the joy in Bob Fosse, you never got to see the fun, the joy. When he did Pippin, he was higher than a kite. I mean, all these wonderful shows he did, you never saw his joy in that show. You saw all his problems. And I really didn't like that part of it, you know? I mean, I understand all his problems, his womanizing, his drinking, his drugs, his, da, 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 his health, but show me the joy too, because that was part of his process. So uh, I would like, I liked it better if, if it had that. If we're talking about TV movies, I would go for Halston, the recent film with Ewan McGregor, brilliant as the designer. Uh, there's been a whole group of really good uh, TV movies recently uh, on people. Uh, and uh, you know, you gotta look for the good ones. So let's see, we just have a couple minutes left. Let's see what you've got. This is a good time to ask me questions. Um, because I am not around a lot. So, I mean, I am, but not to answer questions a lot. So here we go. Oh yeah. Oh boy. So now we're, we're talking about Busby Berkeley. A great musical number is Lullaby of Broadway from Gold Diggers of 35, my favorite Gold Digger film. Uh, amazing dancing and wild filming. The song won the Oscar. Come along and listen to the lullaby of Broadway. Hey, um, the thing is, Busby Berkeley is so wonderful to talk about and then see his films like Girl Crazy, you know, with uh, Judy Garland, the great Judy Garland. See, there was a movie that I had trouble with Judy because Renee Zellweger, as good as she was, she should have used Judy's voice, should not have been Renee's voice. Renee's voice is good and all of that, but it isn't Judy. So if you see that movie and you've never seen Judy Garland, let's say or you've never heard her and you're some young, young, you know, unformed person, um, you don't know. You say, well, what's the big deal about the voice? Well, if you heard Judy, you would know what the big deal was. Mm. That decision was so boneheaded by that, uh, that production. Anyway, uh, let me go to Busby Berkeley for a minute. I mean, how creative, how amazing. Um, Busby Berkeley would lay in the bathtub and draw all this choreography. And he based it on his military background. He had a military background. So you can't, and you really see that in, in uh, Lullaby of Broadway, there's all these marching and there's all these lines and everybody's doing everything at the same time. Uh, but so creative. Now, I'm amazed that the censors, see, before 1933, I mean, you could get away with so much because it was before the production code. Uh, so as late as even 35, the production code really hadn't kicked in. So they got away with a lot before they decided to start censoring. I mean, put my role model, my per, my spirit animal, Mae West. I mean, oh, I love Mae. Well, she got away with a lot pre-35. And so anyway, uh, Busby Berkeley was just shockingly good. I mean, and he, what he did is he started something called cinematic choreography, where you could not do what he did on the theater stage. So he created this world that had to be done on film. And later on, of course, uh, many other people took that on. So, and he also started the 
Berkeley Top Shot. He was the one that invented it and it's still used today and it's still called the Berkeley Top Shot where you have the cameras up here and they're shooting down and uh, you see it all the time now. Uh, it's so, it's just fun and uh, wonderful and a great innovator. And he was a real weirdo. He really was. And he was an alcoholic and uh, oh, there's all these wonderful scandals about him. And I'm just a big fan. So um, I would hope that uh, you, you, you pick up a book certainly on it, on him, but also see his films. That's where he lives. That's where he really lives. Uh, he was very cruel to actual human beings. He was very interested in getting the shot no matter what. So he would actually uh, hurt or maim his stars and his uh, dancers. Uh, he didn't care. He just wanted to get the shot. Esther Williams told me that she used to be scared of working with Busby Berkeley because he didn't care if he about her or if it was a dangerous stunt where she was diving in the middle of fire or swinging on something that and then having to jump. She he didn't care. Just get the shot, and uh, that was his attitude. And uh, you know he's you know that's part of the eccentricity of Hollywood uh, people. Uh, and look what they came up with, these great things that we'll never see again. Fortunately, they're on film. So we're very, very lucky that we still have that. So thank you for asking that. That's so good. Uh, Lullaby of Broadway. Absolutely. Oh, and the music, the music. Uh, yes. OK, everyone. Last few minutes. Yes. OK. Uh, yes, Mae West is my spirit animal. Definitely. I have so many. I have every book I've ever written about her. I love her. She was so wise, so brilliant. Uh, what she did is she made it so you could laugh at female sexuality. You could never do that before. On marriage, you could laugh at marriage. You could laugh at uh, the idea of um, a woman. Okay. Before Mae West, this never happened. Women never got away with enjoying their sexuality, not ever. Mae West comes along, she comes out of New York, she comes out of Broadway, comes along. And suddenly she writes her own material, writes all her own lines, directs herself really. They say no, but she did, she directed herself. She did everything herself. And she decided that her character of Mae West was going to end up happy without a man, or if she had a man, it would be on her terms only. And uh, she would go after them if she wanted to. She would constantly risk rejection. She didn't care. And she had these great lines, you know? It's not the life of my men, it's the men in my life. And it's, uh, it's so many good lines. You know, I used to be Snow White, but I drifted. I mean, everything about her is just terrific, you know? And of course, part of the lexicon, is that a pistol in your pocket? Are you just glad to see me? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, Miss West, Miss, Miss West, haven't you ever met a man who could make you happy? Sure, lots of times. And I mean, she's so great. Uh, and no, women did not have that spirit on screen before that. She completely changed it. She made sex fun and funny. And uh, that was something really great. By the way, uh, the first time marriage really looked like fun in the movies, really fun, a really good marriage, was The Thin Man, great great team, the thin man, Nick and Nora Charles, and of course, the great dog, I Asta. That's when I fell in love with terriers, but uh, if it wasn't terriers, it would have been something else. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, that's the first time marriage looked like a good time. You know, you had, you had Nick and Nora, and they were uh, constantly working together, and they understood each other, and she never tried to change him. And uh, it, and she, he never tried to change her and it was just great. So, uh, you know, movies give us all kinds of different relationships and fabulous people become things because of movies, costume designers, art directors, interior designers. Uh, you know, my sister became a lawyer because she saw To Kill a Mockingbird, right? And she wanted to be Atticus Fitch in that movie. And I mean, everything, uh, oh boy, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's a love affair I have with movies that will never end. Never, never, never. Uh, tonight's event is free to the community. Yeah, I think Catherine wants to make a little, little talk here. Yes, Catherine. I, well, I just wanted to kind of start to wrap things up. If anybody had any last minute burning desire questions. Any um, desires. Yeah, bring it, bring it. Feel free to unmute and pipe up. 
And yes, tonight's event is free thanks to our donors and sponsors. We do welcome a, a suggested uh, donation of $10 and you can go to our website to do that. And, um, oh, there's one last comment. Uh, yeah, Maria says, thanks, Jan and Catherine. This yeah. was such fun. I've got me a long list of films to see uh, through the end of summer. Good, I'm glad you did, sweetheart. I'm really glad. And then uh, Tess says, thank you, Jan. That was wonderful. Thank you, Tess. One of my favorite names. And uh, yes, wonderful. Well, I enjoyed being with all of you and I hope I was able to share you know, how much movies are more than just entertainment. I mean, just entertainment's good too. Nothing wrong with a little escapism, but they can mean a lot more too. And they can make our lives better. They can inform us, educate, inspire, enlighten. I mean, there's a million reasons to love, to love the movies. Oh, thank you, Jan. And you make it all the more fun. So thanks for being with us and thank you everybody else for joining us tonight. We're going to finish up the recording and we'll send it out to everyone who was on the list and it'll be on our website in the future. So again, big thanks to Jan. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you at the next one.